Hello and welcome to the Fighting Spirit Podcast. As always, I'm Jason and I'm here to bring you the retrospective for UFC Fight Night Raleigh where Curtis Razor Blades defeated Junior Dos Santos in what was a very exciting heavyweight bout. There was a lot of exciting action on this card. And we had a very, very exciting night as well, going 75% correct, so we went 9-3. and three. We had a great night, some fighters had great nights, some of my picks had great nights. Let's get into it, here's the show. <laughs> All right, so let's kick it off with the main event, which we did get correct. Curtis Razorblades defeats Junior Dos Santos in a pretty interesting way. So uh, I was going to say, I think everybody would say, how is he going to win? Curtis Blades is going to take Dos Santos down, and he's going to beat him up off his feet. He's going to put him on his back, ground and pound his way to victory. That is the most logical pathway for Blades to get a win. But that's not what happened here. Junior Dos Santos practiced very good takedown defense, and Blades wasn't able to score any But what Blades could do was outbox him, and I think that was all due to the fear and the takedown defense. So Dos Santos had to fight with one hand down in the event that a takedown was going to be shot on him so that he could shuck back away and escape it. And I think that threat of takedown is what allowed Curtis Blades boxing to showcase so well against a guy who generally has better boxing. You know, Curtis Blades ended up catching him with that great shot on the chin. He kind of fainted for the takedown, right? And then he came across with the right hand, clipped him on the chin, and then just beat him up on the cage until Herb Dean, or was it Mergliata, had to come in and stop the fight so that Blades could end up picking up his win. So great action out of him. I don't know what he does next though you know he was interviewed by dc and he's like hey i want my title shot but the problem with that is we got kind of a log jam up at the top right now so we have obviously blades who just win he's deserving of a title shot he's been trying to get one for a while i understand then you have inganu who is more deserving of a title shot and he's also beaten blades twice so i don't want to see them run it back for a third time unless it's maybe for the belt okay then even further up, you got DC who's doing the interview with Blades in the Octagon, uh, you know, that wants his trilogy fight with Stipe before he retires, and then Stipe all the way at the top, who says he won't come back unless his eye is 100% healed, and he's thinking about looking past DC, even though DC wants the third fight. I don't know what's going on there at Heavyweight. I don't know when we're going to see Blades fight again. I don't know when we see Ngano fight again. I don't know when any of this shakes out, and ultimately, if they have to strip Stipe of the belt... Because he can't defend, you know, if he has some kind of health problem and he can't see, I would prefer Stipe retired at that point. Nobody wants to end up with a glass eye like Michael Bisping, you know, uh, you, you want to keep your vision as much as possible so that you can have a nice career and a good life after you exit the UFC. So um, I don't know what's next for Stipe, but if it's retirement, you know, hats off to you, sir. Uh, You were the greatest heavyweight of all time. You went back. You avenged your loss. You have the most defenses at heavyweight. That record could be broken someday, but I don't see it happening anytime soon. And, you know, if that's how it ends, that's how it ends. Uh, So I know we got off track there. They're talking a little bit more about Stipe than Curtis Blades. But the fact of the matter is, I don't know what Curtis Blades does from here. You know, he wants a title shot, but that log jam at the top, the fact that we've already seen him fighting Ghana twice and lose... I don't think it justifies any reason for him to fight anyone in the near future. So we'll see how it goes. And uh, hey, we got it right. So I guess that's all that really matters in terms of the show, right? All right, moving on to the next one. Called it again. This was one of the Patreon picks as well. We went two picks on Patreon. We got this one. We missed Seifers, which, hey, is what it is. But because... Kiesa was such a great underdog, we made money no matter how you played those two picks on Patreon. So if you're part of Patreon, boom, you made some cash. Get on there if you want picks as well. Uh, And this is, you know, these are my solid locks. We'll just call them the locks of the events. And we get a couple in there, and we nailed one of them tonight. Anyways, Michael Kiesa gets it done. Um, Kiesa is one awkward as hell stand-up fighter. Um, He's basically just winging shots, keeping Dos Anjos on the back foot, kind of like I said on the podcast, by the way. Dos Anjos not a good back foot fighter. Wing shots, keeps him on the back foot, and uh, is able to wrap him up and score six takedowns, uh, which was really impressive. You know, Dos Anjos is a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. 
He's also a phenomenal kickboxer. Um, and even when Kiesa had him on the ground, Dos Anjos wasn't able to threaten much. You know, uh, I think he did a very good job defending what Kiesa was throwing at him. But because of the submission attempts, the dominance, especially in the third round with that top position, uh, Kiesa just looked all the better fighter. And I loved his call out at the end. He called out Colby Covington, which would be a really fascinating fight. Uh, I think it's one that Kiesa would be hard pressed to win, though. If he's coming in winging shots just to wrap you up, um, Colby's going to, you know, jab your face nine times by the time you get inside. And good luck taking that guy down. He is a stud wrestler. So this could be kind of a, a plateau that Kiesa is going to have to be on. He's going to have to train with some great wrestlers, sharpen up those boxing tools that he has. Because at the highest levels of this game at 170 pounds, his boxing isn't good enough to go up against a guy uh, like Leon Edwards or Masvidal. And his wrestling isn't good enough to beat Usman or Colby. Not saying he's not a great fighter. He did just beat a former 155-pound champion, the guy that fought for the interim belt about a year ago. But Chiesa is not ready for the big show. Sharpen up your toolkit, sir, and you might be ready for it. Uh, but either way, we did get the call correct. In the next one, Alex Perez defeats Jordan Espinosa. This was a great, exciting uh, performance of the night, actually. So Alex Perez catches him, gets him on the ground, and he's able to put in a great blood choke for, arm, for an arm triangle and just squeeze the life out of Espinosa. You know, he kept him away from the cage. He made enough space where, you know, he could lock it down, and you could see that Espinosa's lights just went out in the cage, and it was a great 125-pound win, and I was happy to make that call. In one that was probably the saddest fight of the night, though, we have Angela Hill defeat Hannah Seifers. And, you know, just from a pure betting perspective, nothing against her personally. I hate Angela Hill. She is so hard to pick for or against. It's unbelievable. Uh, she, her numbers just never shake out. And when they do shake out, I'm usually wrong. <laughs> I hate, do you know what? This is a new rule. We're never betting on a fight that has Angela Hill involved. You know, we uh, we went with Seifers in this one. Hometowner, I didn't mention that on the podcast, but a hometowner. And she looked good, you know. I thought it was a very even first round. I thought that Seifers was exchanging well in the pocket. She definitely had to get inside. She was eating shots, but she was giving shots. And I think she may have been out striking Hill just a little bit. She also had some decent leg kicks that were landing. So she was pretty competent. Then we get to round two, and I'm like, okay, we're, we're kind of looking the same, you know, just to get out of the gate. And then Hill gets this Muay Thai clinch sweep, right? She gets the legs out from underneath her by clinching the head. Boom, she gets Seifers on the mat, and Seifers just not competent uh, in any kind of jujitsu or wrestling, grappling world. She cannot get Hill off of her. It's basically, um, you know, three and a half, almost four minutes of top position mount, ground and pound from Hill, dropping heavy elbows, cutting up Seifers in the bottom. Seifers just not really being able to get back to position, you know. And uh, she she closed it out on her. I, I really wanted Seifers to win this one. I think she was capable of winning. Just didn't play out. Hill got that really dominant position and would not let it go. So hats off to her for you know capitalizing on a opportunity that came around that enabled her to win. So you, you gotta you gotta respect that fight IQ. Some guys will get or ladies will get in positions like Hill. And they lose it. They aren't able to hold it, even though it's a hard-fought dominant position. So hats off to Hill. I really, really liked her performance, even though it didn't pay off for her. So that was the other Patreon pick was Hannah Seifers, and we didn't get that one. But like I said, Kiesa was such an underdog. Definitely made money. Keep that in mind. All right, moving on to the next one. Jamal Hill, Darko Stoisic. Boom. Freaking stars born. This kid is phenomenal. Comes out dancing, showing him on the Dana White Contender Series, having just as much swagger. Shows up and boxes the hell out of, you know, a, a guy built like a brick shit house. Darko Stoisic is a huge, robust man. He kind of is built like Ilona Latifi. And Hill kept hitting him with knees, elbows, head kicks, shots to the body, uh, soul plexus. There wasn't much else Hill could have done except, you know, grapple him to death, right? He beat him up on the feet like like nobody I've ever really seen, right? He is a very, very dynamic fighter, and I know he's green, but this is a kid I'm really liking at, uh, at 205 right now. He looked phenomenal. He was our pick. Unfortunately, though, I think on the Stoic side of things, he might get bounced from the UFC. He has three losses in a row. He did come in with a one win. 
and then he's lost all three by decision. Will he get another crack? Maybe. The dude is tough as hell. He did throw some haymakers that, you know, didn't really connect all that well, but he could have really honestly put Hill's lights out in any one of those exchanges. So I don't know where the UFC sits on this guy. I don't know if they want to let him have one more crack or if it's time to part ways. You know, there's definitely other organizations out there that he could fight for. I, I don't know where, where things stand for this guy, but he's still tough. He still looked dangerous. It's just that he hasn't had a, th- a win in three outings. So, I mean, hey, what do you do with the guy, right? Although, in his loss to Najaku, he did outstrike him and score takedown. So, that was kind of a, a tough way to lose. Either way, though, we got the fight right. And uh, I'm looking for some great stuff out of Jamal Hill. His UFC debut is phenomenal. And this kid is going places. In the next one, we have Bevan Lewis defeat Daquan Townsend. Bevan Lewis, I have never, never really confident when this guy fights. I picked him, and he, I got it right. But he he just, I don't know if it's fight IQ. I don't know if it's striking ability. You know, his wrestling is there. His wrestling is phenomenal. But his striking is just a little awkward, a little unorthodox, and it doesn't really succeed all that well. You know, in a 15-minute fight, three rounds, he the strikes were 36 to 28. It was a lot of... You know, cage hugging um, on the part of Dequan, or sorry, on the part of Bevan Lewis against Dequan, and he wasn't really able to let Dequan find his his rhythm, and Lewis couldn't really find his rhythm either. But if your rhythm, I guess, is hugging a guy and holding him on the cage, he did that. Um, at this level for him, I don't know what Lewis is trying to accomplish. It definitely seems like he's fighting for a paycheck. If you are not at the top echelons, you know, Holly Holm did this in her last outing, Raquel Pennington, and I think we all kind of cheered in on because we've seen what Holm can do when you get to a certain level, and it's like, hey. This is what I have to do to win this fight. I've proven that I can do it everywhere, and I'm an entertainer because that's part of the sport. Um, I, I think he kind of get a pass, right? I, I don't, I don't boo Holly Holm in that situation. But when you're a fighter like Bevan Lewis and you're just coming into the UFC and you're executing these very, I'm just gonna say, you know, kind of boring game plans, it's very hard to get a following. It's very hard to get good shots. Uh, you know, at up and comers, at guys climbing the ladder, because people just don't want to see you get there. They don't want to see you hold a guy down for 15 minutes, even though that is a way to execute a fight. I, I understand. It's it's definitely a, you know, one side of the coin is entertainment, one side of the coin is a sport, and you got to decide which one you want to be there. But I, I kind of like it down the middle. You know, I think that Lewis needs to sharpen his, school, his tool set and get some better wins, more dominant victories. These unanimous decisions, even though he, he just scored one, wasn't dominant. It was just like, yeah, you yeah, outpointed the guy 15 minutes. Congratulations, buddy. Here's your win money. Here's your show money. Get out of here. You know, no, nobody wanted to see you do it again. And I think that's the problem there with Bevan Lewis, uh, which is unfortunate because I think he's a phenomenal athlete. The dude looks crisp as hell, but I don't know if he has the, you know, fight mentality in the back of his head that he really wants to go for it. Either way, though, we did call it correct, and we'll see what's next for Bevan Lewis. He did get a win, so hats off to him, and it was a good pick on my behalf. And the next one, Arnold Allen defeats Nick Lentz. This was a good fight. I wasn't able to actually see most of it, so from here on out, we're just kind of going through the numbers here. Uh, Arnold Allen defeats Nick Lentz. Um, good fight of what I saw out of Allen. You know, he definitely looked a little more competent on the feet than Lentz, but Lentz landed some big shots. He did, I think, stagger Allen just a little bit, and it really showed, you know, Allen being the fighter that he is, so new into his career, kind of on a uh, really steep upper trajectory. You know, he finally ran into a guy on a hard mode, and he had to put him away. So he definitely was a challenge to learn and overcome, and I think it's good for Allen at this stage of his game. You know, he won. He proved that he can beat a tough guy, and so it's on to the next. It's on to the bigger challenge, and nothing against Nick Lentz. He put an outstanding performance in. You know, he had said in previous interviews, you know, I've seen guys like him before. It is, you know, kind of advanced MMA career that are supposed to beat me and make a name for themselves, and I shut them down. And you know what? That's the right attitude to go in and have because he almost did it. I think he almost shut down Allen a couple times. Those shots are just a little bit crisper, a little closer by a couple of centimeters, and all of a sudden, Arnold Allen's on the mat. It didn't work out that way, though. Arnold Allen moved well. He got good shots in. He hurt Nick Lentz, too, himself a couple of times. It wasn't just like he outpointed him. Uh, he went out, and he did it well. Mostly on the feet for this one. And, uh, you know, Arnold Allen just looked like a really good shot at Featherweight. So uh, I was happy to make that call, and I'm happy for Arnold Allen to pick up a victory. And the next one, Justine Kish defeats a Lucy Pudilova. Uh, I called Pudilova. This is one of our other losses on the night in addition to the first fight. Uh, Justine Kish just looked 
Really good. Uh, outstriking Pudalova 2-1, to one, scoring a takedown, um, scoring a pass on the ground to, to get back to a dominant position. And, yeah, P- Pudalova just, I, I don't know where she's at. You know, I think she has the skills and ability to win, but she just isn't really doing it lately, and I don't know where things stand for her. Um, I said this on the podcast, it was definitely a grain of salt situation, but, uh, yeah, we got it wrong. It kind of is what it is. In the next one, Montel Jackson versus Felipe Corrales. Um, not much to say about this one except that Montel Jackson is a beast. He had 75 to 7 strikes. Okay, Felipe only scored 7. Felipe did get a takedown in, but I guess how many Montel did? 11. Okay, uh, Felipe Corrales did threaten with three submissions, but, you know, it just wasn't enough. He, these small threats were nothing for Jackson to get past, and he grounded and pounded. He top gamed his way. Uh, to a win here. He uh, he just fought phenomenal. I like Montel Jackson. The dude looks amazing at Bantamweight, and I'd like to see some really great things out of him in the near future. So hats off to him, and we get that call correct. And the next one, Sarah McMahon defeats Alina Landsberg. Uh, this was really a one-sided contest with Landsberg scoring one strike and McMahon scoring takedowns, 38 strikes, uh, seven passes on the ground. It was really a grappling affair for the most part. A little bit of ground and pound and stand-up for McMahon, but not much out of Landsberg. And uh, I don't know if this was McMahon's last fight. It was so dominant that I think some fighters feel like they're coming back. But McMahon, uh, you know, if she did retire at this point, close it off. She's a legend of the sport, fought all the best, and I called it. I thought she was going to get the win. So, excellent win for her. In the last two here, we had Brett Johns defeat Tony Gravely. It was good to see the Pikey come back. Brett Johns, uh, he just looked phenomenal. This was a real competitive fight, though. 36 uh, strikes for Johns, 6 takedowns. And then Gravely with 5 takedowns, 26 strikes of his own. But ultimately, Johns is able to take the back. And what could have been a split decision, shut the door, not leave it up to the judges, and use that high fight IQ to shut it down. So I was really happy to see Johns do that and pick up a win through his own devices. And then the last one, we got this one wrong. Nate Landwehr loses to Herbert Burns. I thought that Landwehr was putting it on Burns very early, but he caught a knee as he was just throwing a wild to shut the door on Burns, and he went down himself. And so it's kind of hard to say who ultimately would have won that one. Landwehr looked good to open, but Burns was pretty good off the back foot, fighting uh, off the cage, and he ends up putting it away. You know, these uh, debut bouts are tough to score, uh, and I think it honestly could have gone either way, but we got it wrong. So at the end of the night, we got three wrong, nine right. That's 75% accuracy, and I am more than happy to make calls like that. Also, we did make some money last night because Michael Chiesa is a beast against Rafael Dos Anjos, and he was such a good underdog that if you took him, you came out on top too. All right, so that brings us to kind of the end here, the little housekeeping for us. You can get in touch with the Fighting Spirit Podcast at fightingspiritpodcast at gmail.com. You can get in touch with us on Facebook if you're following us there, on the YouTube comments, really anywhere that you like. Feel free to get in touch with the show. Send any of your thoughts, questions, comments, and ideas to me, and I will read them on the air here. Don't have any here today, but, you know, it's up to you to get that out there. Also, we do have the Patreon. If you want those picks that I was talking about on the show earlier, like Michael Chiesa, you want to support the show, just be a good guy, come on down there. The link is in the description below, and you can head on over and support the show at a dollar amount that makes the most sense for you. I will always be super grateful for anyone that does that and if you do not choose to do that you do not have any of my ill will i'm more than happy just to have people listening and uh you know interacting with the show and enjoying what i have so there is no obligation to obviously do that but yeah so we are uh we're gonna have another little layoff so maybe a liquor review coming up the super bowl is gonna be next week i know that obviously it's not on a saturday even though the the ufcs are typically on saturdays but i think that there's avoiding super bowl in the weekend most people are gonna be just really looking forward to the 49ers taking on the kansas city chiefs and what should be a pretty good super bowl so i don't know if you guys watch football out there but i do and I think it's going to be a pretty good one. In that one, though, since this is probably going to be the last podcast before that, I think that the Chiefs are going to win. I'm going to be cheering on Garoppolo and the 49ers, but Mahomes is so good. I think that he's, honestly, at this point in his career, better quarterback than Garoppolo. And I think that the, the, the Niners have a little more in the way of good play. You know, I'm... I'm out of my lane here. Either way, I'm still picking the Chiefs. I think they're going to win the Super Bowl. So I'm not going to get into analysis. Football is not my jam. I've tried it. <laughs> it's just not my jam. I shouldn't be picking football. <laughs> There's no way to look behind that. Do not put money on the Chiefs unless you think they're going to win, please. All right. Uh, so, yeah, we'll be back. And then um, 
So that's going to be the Tuesday or Monday following the Super Bowl uh, for the fight picks for the John Jones Dominic Reyes fight taking place in Houston, Texas, UFC 247, looking like an amazing one here. Uh, we have Valentina Shevchenko also fighting Caitlin Chikagian. And then there's basically just dark horses after that. Um, I think that Jimmy Rivera and Marlon Vera fight got canceled, even though it's still here on the card. I'm pretty sure Jimmy Rivera got hurt. I don't know if there'll be a replacement to take on Cheeto. You know what? Let me look it up real quick. It'll be seamless to you. All right, so it looks like uh, about two days ago they were still looking for a replacement. That would have been a really great fight, um, just not going to take place. Let's see. Uh, for, there's not a whole lot of good ones down here. Andre Uhl, Jonathan Martinez, no. Miles John. I mean, I like Miles Johns, but Mario Batista, it's not it's blowing my hair back. Lauren Murphy, Andrew Lee, maybe. That's that's a, feels like a pretty decent one. Uh, Alex Morono, Diego Lima, all right. Derek, Derek Lewis, Ilya Latifi, I mean, fun fight for sure. See how that goes. Mirside Bektik, Dan Ige. Yeah, I guess Bektik and Ige is actually the third best fight on the card. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of a steep drop-off after the title shots. Um, with that one, you know, Valentina and Chikagian, I'll be interested. Chikagian is pretty tall, pretty big, pretty lanky. Um, it'll just be interesting to see how Valentina deals with her. I haven't done any numbers, but I think you got to take <laughs> Shevchenko in all affairs, maybe except for a Noons trilogy. And then uh, John Jones, Dominic Reyes, offhand, I just got to go with John Jones. We'll crunch the numbers, obviously, and uh, we'll talk about who I'm picking realistically on that one. But, uh, you know, it's John Jones. Uh, how can I How can I offhand pick against John Jones? You know, we'll, we'll get into the nitty-gritty details of it all on the next show. And, uh, yeah, so a little bit of a layoff here. Maybe a liquor or beer review coming in in the interim. But until I speak with you again next time, happy fight picking.